give. We have a giving box in the back, or if you're watching online, you can uh, give on our website, chestergospelchurch.org. Uh, one other announcement, I want to let you know that uh, one of our missionaries has uh, passed away, um, Stuart Law, uh, working out of Zimbabwe, uh, passed away towards the end of January. Um, just so you're aware, his wife plans on continuing uh, the work that they are doing out there. Uh, in their last report, the family was able to come and visit him before he had passed. Um, but they're seeing churches begin to spring up in Z Zimbabwe, uh, as well as the gospel being, being shared and given. So we praise the Lord for uh, his work that he had done while he was here. And we continue to uh, praise the Lord for the work that I'm sure he will do uh, through his wife. Uh, so I just ask you, please lift up the family um, during, during that time as well. All right. Now with that, let's uh, open up in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you, Lord, for this morning, for your love and for your blessings, God, for how you have etched your very words, God, into Scripture for us. Lord, that we might... Uh, have an example, Lord, that we might be able to see what you have called us to do. And Lord, how to lean on you and to act upon what you have done. So Lord, I ask that you please bless this message, bless this time together as we go into your word, that you may be glorified above all other names. Amen. Have any of you ever heard of the saying, time has a tendency to repeat itself? All right, yeah, okay, everybody's kind of nodding their head and sighing a little bit. And, and I would say, yeah, time does repeat itself in a sense, but not so much like a circle, but I've always kind of used more of the, it's more of a picture of a spring. You know, things keep progressing and certain events kind of seem to repeat themselves, though not identically. And the hope is, is as we look back at time and we see things happen, this is one of the reasons why knowing your history is important, that we're able to learn, learn from the past, learn from our mistakes, learn from the things that we've done well that bear to be repeated again. All times, though, we will see instances repeat themselves time and time again, where then we need to reflect and remember where we've been and where God continues to be working on us. Those circumstances around us may change. And the world is filled with uncertainty. One thing remains, and that is our good God. His truth that he has given us. That timeless truth that we can lean upon. His goodness, his mercy, his grace, his son, Jesus Christ. Yes, time changes. But some things don't change so much. And our good God does not change at all. Now, what we've been studying in 1 Corinthians, we see that Paul is trying to help the Corinthian church deal with the culture that's around them. He wants them to hold fast to, yes, this truth of Christ in their lives and to live a life that will consistently show others who Jesus is and how to glorify God at the same time. There are certain things that this church can do that is not sinful in God's eyes, but then there are other things they need to keep an eye out for, that they need to be careful of. The geographer, an ancient historian known as Strabo, who lived around the time of Jesus Christ in 24 AD, this is how he described Corinth in Paul's day. He said that it was a, a wealthy port city, not only because of its fortunate trade location on the isthmus connecting Asia and Italy, but there was its temple of Aphrodite, the goddess of love. It was so rich that it owned more than 1,000 temple slaves, courtesans, concubines, whom both men and women had dedicated to this goddess known as Aphrodite. And therefore, it was also on account of these temple prostitutes, that the city was crowded with people and it would grow rich. For instance, the ship captains freely would squander all of their money in these temple brothels. 
And there was a proverb that even came about during the time period said, not for every man is the voyage for Corinth. So notorious was Corinth for its sexual promiscuity and its prostitution that one of the Greek words for fornication is actually Corinthiasomai. You hear that right at the beginning? Corinth? Wow. So they created for themselves such a reputation that even the language reflected that. Mm. Not so different from a phrase we have in our own culture. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Mm. Maybe don't go to Vegas at all, you know. It's kind of <laughs> yeah. Type of thing. But recognize that this was the situation in which the Corinthian church had to struggle with both men and women. Paul wrote this specifically for them. So I'd like you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians 10 as we begin to look at how Paul is trying to help this church navigate their predicament. 1 Corinthians 10. And today we're going to be working through verses 1 through 13. Remember, this is the Word of God. We're going to cut, right now, this is going to be for the first five verses. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. What on earth is Paul talking about? I thought we were talking about temptation. I thought we were talking about trouble. Well, let's pause here for a sec. What is Paul talking about in these first five verses? Well, he is giving us both. We were talking about history before. He's giving us a history lesson and a list of how the people of God received some very personal blessings from him. Long ago, God had delivered the people of Israel from slavery in Egypt. And during that time, God was both delivering and guiding the people of Israel. The cloud deals with how during that day, God would lead them by the form of a cloud, which they followed. And when the armies of Pharaoh had chased them down, God helped them to cross the Red Sea, the parting of the Red Sea. And they were able to cross on dry ground. And then later we would see that God would even use the parting of the Red Sea to then crush the armies of Pharaoh. And then verses 3 and 4 we see mentioned the spiritual food and the spiritual drink. And what this deals with is this deals with how God had supplied the people with food like manna and water from a rock. But there's some other things that stand out in this text that, that bears mentioning. You see in verses 2 and in 4 through 5, Paul uses the word baptized into Moses. And later he says the rock that was given them, the water was Christ. What Paul is doing here is he is essentially taking something that happened in the past to point them to an understanding of their dependency on Christ in these trials. The fancy theological term is we call them Christophanies. And, we are, and when we are baptized, we are, in essence, we are proclaiming our dependency on God's provision for our salvation, for our lives. And when we have continued to receive the living water of Christ, that means His life and His mercy provides for us in an unending way. So Paul is trying to get this church to look at their history and say, just as Israel was provided for, so are you. Just as God was there with them, God remains with you. See, who Christ is was evident even in there. God, your provider. God, your protector. God, your guide. Jesus Christ. God provided an escape and a way for the people of Israel to endure. 
as he does also you in your trials and your temptations. You see that picture? Israel needed an escape from Egypt, and God made a way. Israel needed a way to endure in the desert. God provided the water. Christ does the same for us. So in history, Israel received great spiritual blessing from God, just as present-day Christians do. But just because you have God's spiritual blessing, we also need to see there at the end of the text that His provision does not mean that you're going to naturally please God in everything you do. And God does discipline those that He has blessed, where He sees necessary. He blesses the children, He disciplines the children that He loves. So yes, God provided an escape through the party of the Red Sea. He provided a way through enduring the trial through the water of the rock and the spiritual food. But we need to make sure that when we remember the history, when we remember these blessings of God's provision, that we don't ignore that God is at work. And in some way then invite His discipline. Let's continue to verse 6. It says, Now, these things took place as examples for us, that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written. The people <coughs> sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did. And 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test. Real quick, what he means by that is, do not seek to sin intentionally as if to test how powerful God's grace through faith in Christ is. As some of them did and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of ages has come. So in this second chunk of text, uh, rather than us learning about God's blessings, we're learning that His blessings were ignored, and in how Israel had recklessly acted as if God did not care about their sin. And because they acted as though God did not care, God had to show them that He did. And over the course of their sin, in one day, we saw 23,000 die. And then over the course of the journey, it came to around 24. God cares about how we respond to His blessing. He cares about how seriously we take what He has asked us to do. Now, does it change that we have saving grace in Jesus Christ by faith? No. But our actions do impact our testimony about our good God. You know, every decision, yes, has consequences, positive consequences, negative consequences. I'm still trying to teach my kids positive and negative consequences. Sometimes they remember to the positive. Sometimes they forget, which leads to a negative. And my prayer is that one day as my children grow up, that they will begin to remember the things that I am teaching them, and that they will apply it, especially when it comes to the area of kids. There's all kinds of temptations and things in this world. And I'm trying to teach them to lean on the Lord. But one of the things this text is trying to remind us is that the cost of indulging ourselves for our individual sake is to also, though, forsake God's provision that He has given. One of the things about when we talk about trials and temptations, it's not uncommon for us to sit in our seats and think about a time where we face temptation. You know, you might be reflecting on a time where, you know, the temptation was that you succeeded in honoring the Lord in whatever situation it is. It might be that you're thinking about a temptation or a time where you failed. 
You know, and we praise God for His grace and we're thankful for His forgiveness. But oftentimes when we reflect on temptation, what we're talking about is what is it I wanted out of the situation versus what did God want out of the situation. That's usually, when we talk about temptations, that's usually what we're talking about. What did I want versus what God wanted? It's a battle of my flesh versus God's desire for me. And we live in a culture today where we are called to, yes, fulfill yourself on wherever you feel called to go, whatever you feel called to be, fulfill that. Whatever it is, go do that. That is what we are taught to do. But God has called us to a different life. When we trusted Christ our Lord and Savior, we gave our lives to Him. And He says, no, if you want to honor me, if you want to glorify me, live in me, trust, obey, be in Christ wherever you go. That's what He has called us to do. And when we choose to give in, we are choosing ourselves. We are choosing ourselves. Sunday school this morning we were talking about Matthew 4 and the trials and the temptation that Jesus faced in the desert. And one of the things we had talked about was the fact that Satan's method of temptation was the same that he tried on Adam and Eve. Satan tried to get Adam and Eve to think about themselves more than they were thinking about God's ways. And when Satan tried to tempt Jesus Christ, he tried to get Jesus to act for himself and not to think about the Lord, his Father. Yet where Adam failed, Jesus Christ succeeded. The cost of indulging ourselves for our individual sake is the forsaking of God's provision. Yes, God provides for the individual, but we need to make sure it's of him and for him and not ourselves. Verse 12, and this is the most popular verse regarding temptation. So I think it's important that we've also talked about the context, but verse 12 says this. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands, and what that means is you stand on your own power, your own will, your own two feet, take heed, lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. But God is faithful. And he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape. That you may be able to endure it. So where's Paul going with this? He says, take heed lest he fall. When we rely on human will and human power, there might be a moment where you might be able to say no to temptation for a second. But you're not going to endure to the end. For what is our power compared to that of Satan? We have none. And we need God there with us. We need His power. We need His strength. We need to remember what He has already accomplished and what He has already done. Why? Because humanity couldn't do it. No matter how you look at the history, humanity couldn't do it on its own. We needed Christ. We needed a way out. We needed a way to endure. We needed Christ. It says here, no one, no one has temptation which has overtaken you that is not common to man. So what is the difference between the worldly man and the spiritual one? What is the difference between the person that does not trust in God and does? The difference is one relies completely on human power and human will, hoping to achieve based on works where we rely on Christ. The power to overcome all sin and all temptation. Why does Paul say all this? Why did Paul go back to history and talk about the Israelites? Paul does this because he wants the church in Corinth to have a different outcome than what happened in the past. 
Remember, God provided an escape. God provided the means of endurance. God took care of them. And yet, they all indulged themselves. And then they were disciplined for it. Paul wants the church in Corinth to have a different outcome. Yes, the circumstance of facing idolatry and sexual sin remains the same. But he is praying that they will obey God in the face of their temptation. And in the face of their temptation, they will lean on him. In what ways are we leaning on God for help? Remember what Paul said about Israel. He gave the Israelites everything that they needed. They escaped a huge army. They survived in the desert. But, even though they had the history, even though they had the knowledge, they did not act on that history. They did not act on the direct knowledge that God had provided a way to escape and endure. And that is what Paul comes back to at the end of this passage. With the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape, that you may be able to endure it. Temptation in this life is just not a one-off. It's not a one-time thing. We will face temptations throughout our entire lives. So it does indeed become a race of endurance. There is the moment, and then there is the entire race. And ultimately, we need not only lean on what we know to be true about God, but we need to act on what we know about God. Don't just remember what is true about God, but act on and in Him. It is not about our willpower that we will conquer, but to conquer temptation, we must embrace God's provision, embrace His help, receive His way of seeing things, His way of doing things. Then we can have confidence that we can overcome temptation because God will overcome it on our behalf. And it is because we embrace both the knowledge of His truth and the power of His grace and the mercy to see us through the trials that we can in Christ, yes, overcome temptation. So what do we do with this? Okay, great. In Christ, we can overcome temptation. But what does that look like? What does that look like? How do we lift one another up? Church, we're not just here to sit and listen. We're here to help one another in this race and to encourage one another as the church. First off, if you know a possible temptation is on the way, yes, pray. Remember, we're coming to the Father in His truth and in His power. So would it make sense that we should be coming to Him in prayer? Jesus instructed His disciples to to ask God, lead not us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And he said, give us this day our daily bread. It is good that we ask God, yes, to deliver us from temptation. To reveal it to us. And yes, even to help us act. How else does it look like? Well, you've heard this before. There are times where it's going to be necessary for you to flee. Flee temptation. If there's no place of endurance, then it is good to run, and it is better to run than it is to experience a bad fall. Stay as far away from sin as you can if that temptation is knocking at your door and you know you can't resist. Lean on the Lord and, yes, flee. Don't stand on your own two feet, as this text says. If you know you will fall, then flee. Um, I have a family member that had... Uh, a very bad addiction to pornography. And the source of it was simply, um, it was, it was, he was addicted to television and then the pornography he was able to get through his television. And he knew it was a sin and it was beginning to become an accepted sin in his life. And it's one of those sins that begins to bleed into marriage and other relationships and it actually has if you ever have you even looked at the science of what pornography does to the mind, it creates an addiction, and it even changes the way 
a person can view the world around them when they fill their mind with pornography. And one day, I hope we can all get such a clear message, but one day there was a thunderstorm, lightning struck, and it destroyed the television. <laughs> you know. But he didn't scoff at him, he didn't laugh. He's like, you know what's crazy is, this is actually going to help me with my pornography addiction. And maybe this is going to help me honor the Lord more. And so what did he do? He said, Lord, you took this TV away from me. I'm not going to replace it. And he chose to sacrifice television. Now, who of us have addictions that maybe would be good for us to maybe uh, put our, phone, our smartphones aside and get a dumb phone? Or, or maybe have that TV off for a while if it is causing us to sin? Did, weren't we also taught that if our one hand causes us to sin, to chop it off? There are times where we need to flee. To leave sin and never go back. Another way is yes, scripture. I know, as a pastor, you've heard all this stuff before. Yes, prayer, fellowship, the Bible, you know, all these things. You've heard it a million times, but there's a reason why we have to keep repeating it. <laughs> but yes, scripture. Jesus Christ in Matthew 4, he used scripture with authority. To battle the temptation of Satan. God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Scripture has a way of making us humble. Because there's no and ifs or buts when it comes to it. Yes, be in the word, know the word. If you're in the middle of temptation, turn to the Lord right there. And yes, pray again. If you're in the middle of it, it's right there in front of you. Pray in the midst of temptation and pray that you will act on what God has called you to do. If you find that you are struggling to pray, then get a brother or sister in Christ to pray with you. It's important that we're praying with each other and helping each other. Ask someone even to hold you accountable. And give them even that authority to help hold you accountable to what you're putting into your mind and what you're giving your eyes. Ecclesiastes 4.12 says, Though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not easily broken. Remember God's faithfulness. It says, God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. In other words, when we are with God, when we are with God, listen, when we are with God, temptation will be overcome. Why? There's no sin in the Lord at all. So if we are in the Lord, how can we give in? Remember God's faithfulness. He provides the provision, the way to escape, a way to endure through it. And yes, remember, sin has consequences, last but not least. To help us act, remember that sin has, co has consequences, but glorifying God, yes, has positive consequences. You know, I follow, I follow the news on pastors and things like that in, in different ministries. And it always breaks my heart when uh, a respected teacher falters, or worse than that, has a life of hidden sin that is discovered that they never repented of. And there's a part of me that, that thinks, all right, they had a wife, a family, a ministry, fill in the blank, they had a service which God had called them to. What are the consequences of this person's sexual sin? What are the consequences? A broken marriage. Maybe even divorce. The children now will never look at their parent the same way ever again. There could be, and then a, there could be estrangement between the children and the church even as well, or the church and God even in those situations. 
not to mention those that, were, that respected the teacher. I've seen it happen where when a teacher fails, people start questioning their salvation. Now, that in good part means they probably relied on that teacher far too much, but what they see is they see someone that they saw as faithful, and then the moment they fall, it's like, well, if this person fell, then I can, then how do I know? And they begin to wonder, God, do you, do you have me or don't you? Galatians 6, 7 says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever one sows, that will he reap. But what is the positive consequences of glorifying God? His pleasure? His glory? Our sanctification? Any number of things which God will help enable to have happened. When David committed adultery with Bathsheba and arranged for her husband's death, yes, God forgave him, but told him the sword would never depart from his house. That his own family members would do great harm and the child he conceived would die. It's true. Sin has consequences. And glorifying God has its. God remains good in all this. God remains faithful. God indeed provides a way of escape. And God provides a way to endure. So yes, we need to lean on Him, and we need to act in Him. We're about to take uh, the Lord's Supper here in a little bit. And my hope is as we do that, that you will reflect on what Christ has done for all our sins. That he has forgiven me of my sin. That he has forgiven me of the times I have faltered in temptation. And I don't say that glibly. It is a great act of mercy and grace that he has done. And he has provided that to us. My prayer is that we will remember and act upon all that God has done. That we may honor him in the times of temptation to give him the glory and the praise. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for this morning, this time together. Help take seriously this issue of temptation. God, whether it is sexual sin, whether it is to steal, whether it is to any number of things, God, Help us, Lord, to honor you in each and every situation. God, help us to remember you and your will, your love, your word. God, the consequences of sin versus the consequences of following you. Lord, let it be for your glory. Amen.